gentlemen, and welcome to this, the 2021 EPRS Annual Lecture, which is going to be given by Pierre Vimont. The European Parliamentary Research Service every year tries to have a, a lecture, uh, usually with either an academic or a practitioner, to talk about some of the big issues in European politics, European history, and in this case today, European diplomacy. This is the fourth in our series. We launched the lecture series in 2008. Professor Desmond Dynan spoke about the institutional development of the European Parliament over the last uh, 60 to 70 years. In 2009, Professor Wolfram Kaiser spoke about different traditions in the evolution of thinking about the EU political system. Unfortunately, last year, we were unable, as a result of the intensity of the crisis, to have such an annual lecture, but we're delighted to resume that process this afternoon with Pierre Vimont. Pierre Vimont has a very distinguished uh, diplomatic career, uh, a major foreign policy maker, both at national level in his own country, France, and at European level, too. He was French ambassador to the United States, French, French permanent representative to the European Union, he was the Chief of Staff, Chef de Cabinet, to three successive French foreign ministers. But for the purpose of today's talk, most particularly, he was the founding Executive Secretary General of the European External Action Service, set up under the Lisbon Treaty, which, as you know, was enacted in 2009, and he took office in 2010, and worked in that capacity for five years until his retirement. Now, he is a senior fellow at the uh, Carnegie Think Tank. He's a visiting professor at Columbia University, and he plays an important role in his capacity as ambassadeur de France in terms of various foreign policy initiatives uh, from Paris, from Paris indeed, where he joins us uh, to talk today. And uh, following his initial remarks, we're going to hear from three panelists who will comment on what he said and give their own perspective on the topic of today's uh, lecture, is there such a thing as European diplomacy? Lessons from the last 10 years. And they are Cornelius Corneliu, the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Republic of Cyprus. Katerina Carter, who is program director and um, head of uh, global governance and security at the Brussels School of Governance. And Ben Jones, who's a teaching fellow in European foreign policy at King's College London. And that discussion will both be introduced and moderated by Frank Debier, who is the director for the Library and Knowledge Sources here in the European Parliamentary Research Service. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Pierre if he'd share his thinking on this important topic. Is there such a thing as European diplomacy? Lessons from the last 10 years. Over to you, Pierre. Uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you for and thanks to the um, European Parliamentary Research Service to um, give me this opportunity to um, uh, uh, launch a few thoughts about um, where is today the uh, EU foreign policy uh, and uh, is there a, a European uh, diplomacy as, uh, as the question has been put and many thanks for helping me to, to share with a, a distinguished panel, uh, uh, among whom I can see um, Cornelius Corneliu, with whom I shared a, a, lot, of, a lot of meetings uh, in the um, council working groups. Um, so that makes us uh, all friends and uh, all hands in the, in the practice of EU foreign policy. Um, I will give you quickly a few thoughts. I don't want to spend too much time and, and Franck um, um, uh, convinced me right from the opening that in order to have a, an as lively conversation as possible, it's not, it's maybe better not to spend too much time in these preliminary remarks, but may need to sketch out um, what could be the kind of uh, background for our, our discussion. Um, when I'm thinking about EU foreign policy today and EU diplomatic action, it's not, in my opinion, that it doesn't exist. It's that it sends um, a feeling of uh, powerlessness, um, of being an entity that is, um, to a large extent, uh, powerless in today's global world, 
uh, when we're facing uh, power politics more and more and global actors that are using force uh, and coercion uh, more and more as, as we go ahead. Um, an immediate comment, maybe first of all, is that this sense of powerlessness uh, doesn't belong only to the uh, European Union. In fact, it's the whole diplomatic trade to a very, very large extent seems powerless at, at the moment. I don't know if Cornelius will uh, go along with me on, on, on that one, but uh, I still think looking at it, even from a French perspective, um, it's uh, fascinating to see how the whole diplomatic process is finding it more and more difficult to find solution and way through when we are witnessing all this uh, multiplication of crisis for which we cannot find a solution at the moment. Uh, and the most recent example, for instance, is one where the European Union has certainly um, got a, a hand, uh, namely the negotiation with Iran on its nuclear program, where we are in company of US, Russia, China, Germany, France, Britain, and where in spite of all this, we haven't been able uh, to find a solution for the time being. So this sense of powerlessness, in my opinion, it's something that we have to put in a sort of re relative um, uh, uh, comparison with what's going uh, elsewhere. Um, yet the question remains, why is it that we have this perception of a lack of efficiency and effectiveness? Because after all, here again, the uh, European Union has an impressive diplomatic toolbox if it wants to apply it. And it has one which is very much in line with the kind of integrated foreign policy all countries are trying to push forward. Uh, look only at the very recent national security review that was made by the UK government, which precisely went into this kind of integrated intellectual approach where, uh, because of the kind of hybrid attacks we're facing, um, uh, we need to use to uh, make uh, the best use of all the instruments we have at our disposal. And this is exactly where the European Union has certainly a real added value. Economic instruments, trade, um, humanitarian assistance, development policy, um, competition policy, climate change, digital, the norms that surround these climate policy or digital policy. Europe has all this. So why is it that in spite of this um, important resources, uh, the EU seems still in a somewhat difficult position when it wants to put um, forward its idea? I think the answer lies in a combination of what I would call um, institutional, um, institutional shortfalls, um, and uh, the need for a change of mindset. I think these are the two ingredients where we need to work on. And I will just very quickly mention these two uh, before uh, uh, giving the floor to, uh, to Franck. Um, with regard to the required change of mentality, I think the European Union requires today uh, somewhat more um, assertiveness more clarity and more trust between the institutions themselves on one side and between the institutions and, and the member states. Um, assertiveness, it's because diplomacy today, in my opinion, face a double challenge. Um, a challenge about the fact, as I was um, underlining a few minutes ago, a challenge uh, uh, stemming from the um, power politics we're facing today and the fact that this is changing completely um, the, um, the aspect of what we were doing so far. And for the European Union being a champion of multilateralism um, and the champion of what I would call um, the amicable, uh, the friendly approach uh, and the idea that um, we should um, uh, always use dialogue um, and um, 
uh, and the need for better um, relations between all of us, um, the uh, use of force as it stands today becomes a real challenge for the um, for the um, for the European uh, for the European Union. Uh, the second one, it seems to me, in terms of assertiveness, is precisely the hybrid challenge that we're facing today, and the fact that as we have to struggle with uh, child, with weaponizing of uh, migration, as we have seen it in in Belarus, as um, um, coercion, economic coercion, as we're seeing more and more, uh, the European Union has to find behind all these threats, uh, the political threat that is there, the political dimension. In a European process where all too often we're looking mostly about technicalities and the political dimension has to become more and more uh, the real um, constraint and, and, and the real imperative with which we have to, to work. More trust, I'll be very quick, it's about how between institutions um, we can provide more uh, uh, more openness, more frankness about what each one is doing. It's the whole issue about the silo process where each one is working on its own. And also with the member states, it, it's about a better understanding of where we must allow member states to go on their own because in terms of foreign policy, in the field of foreign policy, member states still want to regain some sovereignty and we have to accept that. But at the same time, where the European Union can have a complementary added value. Um, and here also, this is where we need to improve our act. Third point about um, clarity. I think there, um, and I would like to insist on that point, the European Union has to find its own brand of diplomacy. I think that for the European Union, it's not about inventing what the other members, what the member states are already doing. Um, it's not about reinventing what has been done so far. It's about um, finding with its uh, um, specific uh, uh, toolbox, uh, finding an addition of non-military tools, uh, finding a new way of um, looking at um, uh, the dialogue we've had so far and reinventing a new brand of dialogue. I suppose revisiting multilateralism at a moment when multilateralism is under heavy, uh, a strong threat and being attacked from all sides and maybe going for a more flexible multilateralism with different partners around the world playing more with regional multilateral actors here and there in the Indo-Pacific, in Africa, in Latin America. I think here also we need to invent and be more innovative. That's for the change of mentality. Very briefly on the um, improving of the um, institutional uh, setting. Um, why do we have to do that? It seems to me that here um, we have to take into account the complexity of the of the institutional framework of the EU um, and accept the fact that when we uh, um, set up the external action service and that we create that very specific nature of the external action service somewhere between the commission on one side, the council on the uh, other side, but at the same time failing to give to the um, uh, EEAS the kind of autonomy it may require according to the kind of uh, work it has to do, uh, we need to look again at this um, very small autonomy the External Action Service has. It must be allowed, for instance, to have its own strategic papers being put on the table. Um, it needs to um, have more autonomy maybe for its um, delegations. Um, it needs maybe to invent its own corporate identity, which is very difficult at the moment. Maybe to review some of its recruitment rules, uh, to adapt it to the specificity of the, uh, of the service. I think there is um, um, uh, uh, a lot of, uh, of work to be done there. And, and I think um, this is where 
uh, we need to um, uh, improve our act. There should be also, in my opinion, more clarity in the mission that should be um, uh, attributed to the external action service. So far, it never had, in fact, a, a, a real mission mandate. We don't know if it's simply a coordinator of what all the other uh, services are doing. Uh, should it be a factory of ideas um, and come forward with um, uh, new ideas? Uh, should it be the sort of um, uh, uh, protector of the kind of strategic vision we would like um, to have? Um, should it be the one in charge of implementing um, alone? Um, and in a sort of um, tower of control, control tower, all the decisions that are taken by the EU institution in the external uh, action field. Um, this is not clear at the moment. And there is, in my opinion, a new um, urge for clarity there. Um, in the three field, I think are always important with regard to um, diplomatic action. One is the level of strategy, the level of long-term vision one wants to have. And this is where I think the input of the external action service could be important in order to um, help all the other institution and the different services inside the institution to have a sort of common vision uh, about where to go uh, in the years ahead. The second level is the level of the foreign policy itself, the priorities that one wants to assign to its foreign policy. And here, quite often, we miss that level. In other words, we have very good, solid um, strategic visions, but we lack then after, thereafter, the way to go from there to uh, uh, priorities. Let me give you an example, our China strategy. A very good, um, uh, a very good, clear-cut vision. Uh, China is a competitor, a partner, and a systemic rival. How do you implement that? How do you go from that um, overall vision uh, to something that looks like a EU a diplomacy and EU foreign policy? And the third level is how to operationalize all this. How to go to the operational level. Uh, and here again, I think we need to improve our act there also, using all this toolbox I was uh, discussing earlier on, coming up with innovative ideas in all the fields I mentioned very briefly uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, I think these are the three levels where major achievements could take place and where progress has to take place. I think we are at a very interesting moment um, where there is a, a paradigm shift taking place, uh, not only for the external action service, but for all the actors inside the EU foreign policy, institutions and member states alike. And I think this is why I think this conversation, I hope, can be helpful. I'll stop there, Anthony. I've been quite too long uh, and I give you back the floor or give back the floor to Frank, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed, and we really appreciate that. No, you haven't been too long at all, and you've left a lot of opportunity for questions and answers, comments, not least, of course, from the panel we're about to hear from. We are now uh, well over 100 people online. The number's been growing uh, in the last uh, five or ten minutes, and I think we're in line for a, a great conversation. If you permit me a moment of British irony, I believe that Roy Jenkins, but I suspect you'll appreciate this, as a, as a diplomat, that Roy Jenkins was one, one once asked by by um, a non-native British speaker, what is the difference characteristically between a lecture and a speech? And he replied, well, a lecture characteristically is somewhat longer than a speech, but not necessarily more interesting. And I think in the model that you're adopting here, and hopefully which we're pioneering today, uh, the lecture is shorter and more interesting, and I think it was a real, not only a tour d'horizon, but a tour de force, if I may say so. So it's with great delight I hand over to Frank Depier, who will take things from here. Over to you, Frank. Merci beaucoup, Anthony. Thank you very much for these introduction uh, remarks that are very illuminating. We are going to follow during this annual lecture the three levels you have proposed for the analysis. Uh, the value added of the European Action Service 
in shaping a strategic a common vision between the European institution, a kind of common welt and showing a common approach also to our site. And we will do that with uh, Professor Katerina Carta to explore the issue. And we will go to the value added of the European diplomacy for EU member state. And this is why we have asked a top diplomat in action today, Ambassador Cornelius Cornelio, the permanent secretary of the foreign minister of the Republic of Cyprus to join this panel. We are very honored that he could accept our invitation in what is more today than a busy agenda with migration issue, Lebanon tension with Russia, so high on the agenda. And uh, finally, we will uh, explore what you call the toolbox the added potential given to the EU diplomacy by the development of the CSDP and also other current initiatives, including those soon to be discussed in the European Council, to develop additional capacity for action. But let's start with the first section of our lecture. Katerina Carta, you are the program director of uh, the Master in Diplomacy at our neighboring Brussels School of Governance in the VUB and an assistant professor in international relations there. Clearly a transatlantic scholar having previously been associated professor of political science at Laval University in Quebec, and you're also teaching at Siena, London School of Economics and ULB. Your work include uh, as soon as 2012, the European Union Diplomatic Service IDs and Preference and Identity, and must say you are one of the first scholars really to address the issue and the problematic of the external action service that was in the building at the time and still is. So for you, how do you assess the value added of the external action service when it comes to shaping a common vision between the European institution, a common approach to, to foresight. And this question is very timely with the recent publication by the EIS of the Strategic Compass, Katerina Carta. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me. And many thanks, Ambassador Vimon, for your insightful and succinct uh, presentation. I hope not to disappoint the audience at this point. <laughs> you have already highlighted with some candor some of what you called institutional shortfall surrounding that post Lisbon machinery to deal with external action. I will perhaps repeat here and there some point, but I would like to comment on the EU, on the EIS and the, and the, um, sword, the, the sword of institutional and organizational constraints that still stand on the way of its ambitions. I will clearly uh, take the chance uh, to, to raise some questions for you and, uh, and the audience. But let me start by raising the obvious. Considering its unique institutional location, the role of the EIS should be a pivotal in ensuring they use comprehensive uh, and integrated approach. And yet, and as usual, the devil is in the detail. As you have widely consider, uh, considered here and elsewhere, when it first was established, the role of the EIS was surrounded by ambiguity and the increase of gray area of overlapping responsibilities among institutions operating in the field of external action. The fact remains, in your own words, Ambassador Vimon, the 2010 Council decision, it's an administrative charter. It's not a political statement. So although much has been achieved in these years to clearer guidelines on institutional cooperation, the political mandate of the EAS stands vague and loosely defined. This underlying ambivalence on the role and relative autonomy of the service, quite literally a service as disposal of other EU institutions, still contributes to the difficulty in defining the EAS raison d'etre. And the question of the EAS raison d'etre, it's now accentuated by the ambitions of the current conditions to be truly geopolitical. So in the light of both its ambiguous status and the commission's ambitions, in which specific competences lies the service added value? 
as of recent, uh, uh, David O'Sullivan wrote the Commission and EIS should work more closely together. But what are the preconditions for making this cooperation truly work? And do you see a reflection in this direction taking place in the Commission's and the EIS headquarters? I would personally argue that despite it, its, let's call it structural ambiguity, the EIS, the EIS has managed to perform its role in support of the high representative vice president rather well. I would perhaps highlight three positive contributions that will most likely be of structural importance for the high representative vice president. Strategic planning, monitoring and exposing this information and systematically sustaining the high representative vice president in public diplomacy activity. So in the matters of strategic planning, the strategic policy planning has set up a modus operandi, which is progressively bringing about the consolidation of a community of institutional and national policy planners and analysts. This could arguably contribute to the emergence of a common strategic culture in the European Union. Then, second, on this information, despite the allegations of having watered down a report on Chinese disinformation, the work on this information that the EIS has managed to do since 2015 has been innovative and overall useful for both the, e, uh, the I representative and the European Union as a whole. At least, this is my perception as an observer. Finally, in the area of public diplomacy, we all know that institutional public diplomacy is in constant need of strategic reflections and always needs to navigate the personal character of the post holders as high representatives and a series of institutional rigidities. And there, I believe that the EIS should as much as possible work on a diplomatic network strategy at the national and institutional level and try to work beyond institutional communication as it is doing in the field of international cultural relations, for instance. Ambassador Vimon, do you think the ES could do better than it's already doing in this regard? Of course, the first 10 years of the service also shows shortcoming uh, as you were uh, conceding. I would echo your reflection and emphasize three. First, no service, let alone a foreign service, can work without being endowed with a precise mission. Second, viable and mutually beneficial inter-service cooperation should proceed rather than follow the establishment of a new institution. And third, operational, political, and financial responsibility of common measures needs to be linearly allocated. We may discuss further how to improve its ability to serve the high representative and other institutions, but I believe that the question of endowing the service with a precise mission, it's a precondition for any further discussion. And if you allow me to go back toward, uh, to some, some points I previously raised, the successes of the EIS in the field of strategic planning, disinformation and public diplomacy underscore the fact that the EIS added value. It's mainly in the area of strategic analysis and communication. And I think this is great, but there is a risk that the EIS concedes the terrain of external policy development and implementations to other institutions, not least given the fact that most of the Commission's big ticket items, including climate and technology, have a strong external dimension. So, I think that the technical expertise often found in the Commission, it's critical to the process of policy development and implementation. But I also think that the EIS should be at the center of this process because it's the only actor that can link, as you were mentioning, the different aspects of the EU's external action. We can see the forest of the EU external actions and not just the trees. So I think it is critical to, mit to mitigate the risk of the EIS being confined to think tanking functions, the role of back office of the high representative vice president of some sort of combinations of both. Bottom line, EU diplomacy and for that matter, any diplomacy can only work if sustained by adequate resources and political cohesiveness. In this regard, the role that the EIS is playing in designing the strategic compass is noticeable. 
the compass effort to bring member states together in terms of threat perception, strategic culture, and foreseeing additional capabilities constitute a promising step in that direction. And I leave it at that. Thanks for your attention. Merci, uh, uh, many thanks. Uh, a first reaction, Pierre, to this uh, uh, first analysis that there is a risk for the external action service to become victim of its success in a strategic mapping and to being a curtail in a, a function of think tanking unless uh, a, a better mission statement and adequate resources are found. How do you assess the, this risk and what can we do so that this analysis, which is uh, acknowledged as extremely useful and as building a common culture, is then followed by the, the right steps in action? Many thanks, Katerina, to bring this debate. Um, yes, many thanks to Katarina for um, putting a lot of very interesting questions. Um, uh, maybe as a first step, if, she, if Katarina allows me, uh, and I'm sure Cornelius may want to, uh, to come in at, at, at this stage, um, it seems to me that the problems or the challenges, let's put it that way, the challenges uh, Katarina is underlining are challenges that not only the ES is uh, encountering, uh, it's the kind of challenges that most foreign affairs ministries uh, all around Europe and, and elsewhere, I think, are facing in, in nowadays. It's about being in more and more forced to focus on crisis management uh, and not being able, contrary to uh, uh, maybe uh, what should be necessary, um, uh, is to have time enough uh, for um, uh, strategic analysis, therefore leaving the strategy mostly to policy planning staffs, um, which are very good, of course, but which are not involved in the daily work of diplomats and sometimes can appear and be perceived as somewhat um, uh, sidelined and marginalized with regard to the difficulties, the very concrete, practical difficulties uh, we're facing. Um, it's all very well uh, to think about stability and security in the, uh, in the Gulf region, for instance, but the real issue today is how to get back Iran into the GCPOA. <laughs> and um, this usually poli policy planning staff um, are somewhat um, out of the picture there, uh, it seems to me. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one of the first issue. And of course, coming back to what Katerina was saying, um, the fact that uh, uh, diplomats are most of the time involved in day-to-day in -day work and crisis management, uh, they, they lose the long time uh, game, uh, the strategic vision. And the risk, of course, is for the external action service being more and more involved in that kind of analysis uh, to be seen as a, a very good um, analyst, uh, um, uh, making very good assessment of the situation, but not being much involved in the reality of the daily diplomatic action. And, and that's one of, of the risk. Um, the second one being, and I think this is to some extent what we are observing nowadays, is that as this sense of um, power politics, um, this feeling of uh, the urge for the European Union to be more assertive and to come up with um, a better sense of what uh, its identity is all about, this perception is percolating in many of the Commission uh, uh, departments. And look, for instance, what we have seen, I think it is today, the uh, release of the um, uh, DG Trade proposition on anti-coercion instruments in the field of trade, in the trade field. Um, this is typically and very interestingly uh, something uh, and an initiative, to put it in other terms, and an initiative that is very much linked to the whole issue of how can the EU speak the language of power, 
how can the EU become a, a, a genuine a global player? And there you see uh, an initiative, uh, a legislative uh, initiative, uh, that is mostly in the hands of DG Trade and not probably as much thought through um, with the external action service as it could be, uh, maybe. Uh, so here again, uh, this is something we need to take into account. Third point, and I promise I'll stop there, with the point Katerina made about how that may be, after all, one of the important um, tasks of the external action service is to sustain the action of the high representative, and she's absolutely right there. But in my opinion, one of the problems we're facing today is where does exactly the high representative fit into the policy decision making um, process in the in the in the foreign policy field, and here I find a, a bit of a of a contradiction there. The high representative sits in the European Council, uh, uh, which, as we all know, has become the place where major strategic political decisions are being taken. Uh, um, being there, it seems to me that the high representative and therefore the service that sustains his work and works with him closely should be at the center of how do we operationalize the decisions by the European Council in the foreign policy field? How do they implement step by step um, these, um, these guidelines, these policy guidelines that have been set up by the um, uh, by the um, uh, by the European Council, and how do they work in good coordination and cooperation with the different services in order to be sure that those main guidelines will be respected and will be seen through? I think this is really where um, we need to improve uh, the current uh, working process of the European Union. Uh, but Frank, I stop there. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Pierre. Uh, inter very interesting and important point on uh, the European Council. As uh, uh, colleagues know and attendees may know, we we are doing a little part of the work in uh, the EPRS, uh, trying to follow very closely uh, what is uh, what is the follow up on a European Council decision in the field of foreign policy, but also on other fields and providing our members with uh, uh, an assessment and documentation so that they can do their part of the job. But clearly, uh, the link between the, the European Council decision and the, the kind of whole uh, d'ensemblier that could have uh, the external action service is at this point missing and being discussed also uh, in academic literature. But to introduce Ambassador Cornelius Cornelio into the, the discussion, Ambassador, we're very happy to have you with us. You are the permanent secretary of the Ministry of the Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Cyprus. As our Director General mentioned, you have served as a permanent representative to the EU in Brussels, also as a permanent representative to the UN in uh, New York, and as ambassador in Austria, and the many UN institutions present uh, in Vienna, as well as an ambassador in Paris. And uh, we know that the Republic of Cyprus is constantly engaged in efforts to resolve the Cyprus problem, but it is also obviously exposed um, more than the rest of us um, uh, to all developments in the Middle East, uh, especially in neighboring Syria and Lebanon. It is also, as Greece is, one of the landing ground of uh, current migration. And in this context, how do you see the complementarity or the value added of the EU diplomacy for your country? Many thanks again to be present in the middle of a, a very busy agenda we can imagine with us today to, to discuss it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, and it's a, it's a great pleasure 
to share the floor with such distinguished uh, panel, uh, especially with Pierre Vimont, an old friend from Brussels during the first uh, Cyprus presidency of the EU Council. Uh, I have fond memories and of course he was uh, uh, a great supporter of our presidency. Um, I, I wanted first to mention a few things about the EAS. Uh, the, the, uh, my, my reading is not uh, as negative as uh, it uh, sounds. I think the EAS uh, has come a long way uh, in its mission. Of course, uh, we can uh, be more effective and there, are, there is uh, a way to be more effective. At the end, uh, it comes down also to member states and to the institutions. But uh, the, the European Union has uh, a strong voice on a number of issues, be the climate change, the rule of law, the human rights. Uh, uh, I was, uh, as you mentioned, ambassador at the United Nations in New York, and uh, I recall very vividly the weight of the, the European Union when we had a common position on the different draft resolutions. So it's important to remember that. Now, coming to, to Cyprus, I think Cyprus has followed uh, a similar path with the uh, External Action Service. We've been a member state for 17 years. Uh, it took us eight years to understand uh, uh, the, the benefits uh, of uh, our membership and also um, uh, that uh, we could uh, have played uh, a more um, uh, uh, instrumental role with regards to common foreign policy. Um, and uh, I must say that uh, coming back from Oman this morning, uh, uh, that uh, Cyprus has uh, a lot of diplomatic clout uh, in the region. And this is because of the European Union membership. I mean, we should not forget that. Cyprus has always played uh, a very constructive role uh, in the region. Uh, we don't have a problem with our neighbor with our neighbors with the exception of one but um, uh, definitely uh, the membership of the european union has given us uh, the diplomatic clout uh, in order to play the role of a bridge between uh, that region and the european union these uh, these countries these peoples believe in the soft power of the european union and I think it's important now that there is uh, a vacuum uh, in that region to have a more strong presence uh, of the European Union. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of interest at stake, um, and uh, I think it's important to uh, to play uh, to play this uh, this this role. Um, Heading the, the, the foreign service of a small member state, uh, I can attest firsthand uh, to the usefulness uh, of, the, of the common foreign policy. And uh, I think it's important because it gives you also access uh, to, to third countries. And uh, it's, an important, it's an important tool. Um, the European Union is not um, a world power per se in the traditional sense of the word. Uh, it's not uh, operating as an individual country, hence uh, the difficulty to come uh, to a common position on uh, certain issues, including uh, with regards to the Middle East, uh, but also sometimes with regards to, to our neighbor. Uh, at the same time, you, we see that there is um, a degree of maturity in our discussions. Uh, we take decisions much quicker uh, as on a on, on number of issues uh, which uh, were more difficult to agree in the past. Um, definitely, uh, the landing zone is not always, you know, a landing zone where everyone feels uh, very comfortable. But um, uh, the, the lesson learned uh, from those 17 years of participation is that uh, um, when we have uh, a common position, this makes us stronger. So uh, we need we need we need to, to work uh, further in that regard. We, maybe the strategic compacts uh, compass will will give the answer, uh, but uh, definitely our citizens. Um, uh, expect uh, have high expectations from from the EU. Uh, they, 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 we cannot um, we cannot leave uh, unanswered all these threats. Uh, the EU has uh, a role to play in this regard. European autonomy 
conference of the future of Europe. I mean, we need to um, exploit all the opportunities that we have uh, in the months to come. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, the good question uh, to, to Pierre following uh, your in intervention and uh, the positive evaluation uh, of the, the potential leverage uh, the belonging to the European Union uh, and the common position is given to an individual member state diplomacy is, Pierre, how do you view the value added uh, uh, in implementation of the external action service in support of diplomatic activity of the member states? Uh, we, we see clearly that there is a value added of having a common position. There is a value added of belonging to the European Union and being able to speak on its behalf. But when it comes to diplomatic activity on the field, is there something the external action service is bringing and bringing even more uh, recently than before to the, the national diplomacy and the national diplomatic effort of the different member states? Um, yes, it does. And I, and I think uh, Cornelius raises a very, a very good point about the um, added value of a, of a common position in multilateral fora or elsewhere. Uh, it brings um, a political clout, as he, as he said, uh, a political weight um, uh, that uh, member states individually uh, don't have. But then uh, Cornelius' point brings about another question, which is one that I personally find um, uh, worrisome at the moment is that precisely what was um, seen by all member states as this added value um, coming out of a common position seems to be um, somewhat dented um, uh, today uh, by some of the member states who are ready to uh, stand on, on their position and prevent precisely the adoption of a common position. Um, we used to have uh, a, a few years ago in our different working groups in the uh, in the European Union, and I'm sure Cornelius remembers that um, this idea that we had some a somewhat an obligation of of result um, that at the end of the day, whatever our differences, we need to agree on something because this was the only way to move forward. And in the field of foreign policy, the only way to be seen as a relevant actor in the international scene. Uh, it seems to me that today this conviction has someone, um, it hasn't disappeared, but it's somewhat under, uh, under threat um, and being more and more undermined by some of the member states that are ready just to let it go and not have a, a, a common uh, an agreement at, at the end of the day. By the way, it's not only on, on, on foreign policy. You can see it um, currently on the whole issue of migration, where we have been struggling for now four, five or six years among member states to reach an agreement on, on the um, uh, migration pact or the different proposition put forward by the Commission, and we haven't been able um, to. Uh, it's difficult, we all know that, but it seems to me that what was very important in the decision making process of the European Union, namely um, the common conviction by all member states that at the end of the day they needed to find some sort of agreement. Um, um, and in my opinion, this has nothing to do with qualified majority or unanimity. It's, it's definitely a political conviction that needs to be shared by everyone. And it seems to me that this is at the moment under pressure um, and under threat. And uh, we need to be um, very much aware of that. But having said that, I am, I think, what Cornelius was saying about the uh, uh, the um, existence of an added value by the external action service, or more generally by the European diplomacy, is definitely there. Um, and I could um, I could give more more examples of this. Uh, I alluded to that in my preliminary remarks. But the normative power. Um, 
the power of the European norms uh, nowadays um, in terms of influence um, and in terms of, uh, of uh, political leverage um, in the norm in the um, in the digital uh, uh, field, uh, for instance, I think more and more as we go ahead in trying to uh, act with regard to climate change, we will see more of that also with the decisions the European Union will be taking uh, on this issue, on the in environmental issue. Um, I think uh, one could also um, think of the European Union, I mentioned that also earlier, at a moment when the multilateral system, the UN and its agencies are under pressure uh, and having more and more difficulty in, in uh, finding their way through this um, global uh, these global politics as we see them today um, Europe which has always prided itself in being a champion of multilateralism could help uh, through innovative ideas a new way of working with the different uh, multilateral partners could find maybe a new way of regaining some efficiency for the multilateral system um, it seems to me that we have a whole field there of uh, interesting actions to be um, uh, to be taken. Could I add a third point? Maybe it's about human rights. Um, we are the promoters of um, uh, of values. Um, the Europe uh, prides itself in uh, defending and promoting values, and we're facing today um, at the level of the member states more and more um, obstacles to the promotion of those values. And the trend among member states is quite often to leave it to, um, to the European Union to defend these values. Um, and therefore, for the European Union, there is a special responsibility to find a new way of promoting these values without appearing um, lecturing our partners condescending um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and being more in a listening mode with what our partners have to say on these issues. Uh, um, so therefore, uh, a new way of having a useful dialogue on uh, human rights, on democracy, on all those values the EU is prom promoting could be another added value that we could bring to the uh, toolbox of uh, diplomatic toolbox of the national member states. So there's plenty to do. Uh, and in my opinion, at the end of the day, it's about being uh, assertive enough inside the EU institution and at the level of the external action service to promote uh, innovative ideas and to be um, assertive enough to take the lead on some of these fields. Um, I totally agree with Cornelius that uh, the ES has achieved a lot already. Um, uh, and I haven't uh, given the list at, at the beginning of my, my remarks because uh, I wanted to be short and straight to the point. Um, but you could find uh, uh, many, um, many issues. Uh, I, I mentioned Iran at the beginning. The whole Iranian negotiation started with, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, the EU. Three member states uh, supported by Javier Solana, who was then the high representative and who took um, the lead of the, uh, the whole group when it enlarged to the other uh, permanent uh, members of the Security Council. Um, what we have tried in with regard to the Middle East peace process by setting up the quartet with the UN, the US and Russia. Um, what has been tried and is still trying with difficulty, uh, needless to say, but still, it's the EU which is in the lead in trying to uh, uh, push forward the dialogue between Serbia and Kosovo and in other parts of the Western Balkans. So there are a lot of achievements. Um, no way, I agree entirely. Um, but we see very well that more needs to be done, of course, and that we need to find the right path for this to happen. The risk of, um, I fear sometimes, the risk with the External Action Service is to be um, 
somewhat um, resigned to the fact that the divisions between the member states are so huge um, uh, that there's no use in trying to reconcile and that um, uh, the ES should constrain itself uh, to some of the routine work um, that it is doing already rather well, but that uh, trying to come up with new ideas, innovative ideas, sometimes audacious ideas, may be too risky and not worth, um, not worth the try. Uh, back to you, Frank. <laughs> Merci, Pierre. Uh, very interesting so far. Key points when it comes to foreign policy making, uh, the importance of a, a common position, the importance of the normative power of the European Union that was discussed already many times uh, within our own EPRS, where we, we discussed the, the very good book published uh, on uh, this issue, the normative superpower of uh, the, the EU, but also maybe innovative ideas about how to organize dialogue with partners uh, uh, beyond even the, the traditional question of human rights, and also a continued activity in uh, preventive diplomacy and uh, through new format where the Euro European Union is well placed, uh, maybe sometimes in an opportunist fashion to, to take the lead uh, because there is demand also in the international community. So quite uh, a large number of ways to, to do and uh, to which uh, the, the member state can relate. We now go to your third level, Pierre, if you allow, which is the toolbox. When we read uh, the compass, the strategic compass, there is a lot about new tools, new toolbox. I think there is at least 10 to 12 toolbox mentioned in the strategic compass. And I would like to ask um, Dr. Ben Jones of King's College, who is a CSDP scholar, uh, to, to challenge us a little bit on, on that one. Uh, the EU does not have only a diplomacy or a diplomatic service, it also has a common security and defense policy. And uh, what is the benefit, uh, according to, to you, Dr. Jones, uh, that the EU diplomacy derives from this policy already? And what could be the additional benefit it could derive in the future? from its linkages with the CSDP. And maybe you can also challenge us all on capacity building. This is a topic on which you have recently published uh, on the challenges of capacity and development and the linkage to the, the wider strategic vision of the union. So Dr. Jones, floor is yours. We, we start uh, immediately with one question of the floor with the expectation that he may join us at a later stage. As a Director General has said, uh, the connection within the EP may be a little bit shaky to, today, we will experience problem. Uh, one first question uh, to all panelists is what could we expect from the Conference of the Future of uh, Europe uh, on progress for uh, the EU diplomacy. Do we have uh, any expectation there of what can come out of this debate? Uh, well, obviously, our politics and the new context in which we operate, very different from the one 10 years ago, is part of the, the discussion. Any expectation? on that front, first maybe Pierre and then Katerina, uh, Ambassador Cornelio, because I'm sure that this debate is also capturing attention in Cyprus. I'll be very quick because I think uh, ben, ben Jones is back, uh, Frank, and, and therefore you may want to give him the floor. But uh, as, a, as a sort of connection to what Ben may say, I would say looking at what we've got so far, uh, out of the um, 
uh, debate in France on this inside the framework of the conference on the future of Europe, it's about defense and security precisely. And this is nothing new. I think many surveys in the past have shown that uh, public opinion in Europe is very much in favor of, of moving uh, further uh, towards a European security policy and, and, and defense policy. Um, this is what I get from, from the ongoing debates in, in France. I'm very sorry about about the falling out there. Um, I think what, what's the headline? Was it England fog in the channel continent cut off or I, something like that very much springs to mind. Um, uh, but anyway, let me let me try and be brief as well. Um, I guess it's incumbent on the final speaker in a panel to try and keep things brief. Um, my field is 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 sort of defense and um, security policy and you know, uh, really fascinating comments from uh, Ambas Ambassador Vimon there. And, and you know, um, he, he mentions power politics, a world of, of an increasingly a world of power politics. And I think that makes some people think, well, what tools should the EU actually have, which which reflect that world of power politics? What tools should the European Union have uh, in the military sphere? Um, and, and of course, that's quite connected to this new buzzword around strategic autonomy uh, and what exactly that means. And, and I think for some, it, 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 it means probably for a minority, but I think it does mean a, an EU defence policy that stands on its own two feet. Um, but I think more, more traditionally, ever since San Marlo and, bef and, and perhaps before, it's meant it's meant a, a useful level of autonomy from the United States, an ability to do things um, without needing to call on um, the, the, the political and military leadership of the United States. So I think what is interesting at the moment is, is the way that, because of course in this field, the, the, the elephant in the room uh, is an American elephant uh, in, in defense policy. Uh, and I and I think there's that there's a fascinating dynamics within within the NATO alliance, which which Europeans respond to. So to draw on 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 some academic concepts, um, that very often we talk about this notion within an alliance of the fear of entrapment and the fear of abandonment and the way these things um, translate into policy. And I think both kind of provide something of an explanation for why CSDP came about and why it exists. On the one hand, there's this fear of Europeans that, 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 that they're destined to become trapped in American foreign policy and therefore military power, and you see this very much in, in, in UK post-war foreign policy, having military power to contribute is a means to influence. And therefore the European Union can be a way to aggregate military power and therefore demonstrate to the United States that Europe has something to offer. Um, and I think that's a response to, to, to that fear of entrapment and, and the desire to, to work together to increase capabilities to be a more relevant power. On the other hand, we have this, this fear of abandonment. And, and I think it's, it's a two level thing. On the one hand, it's, it's a fear of a kind of existential abandonment, which, which a total abandonment by the United States, which, which may have seemed far fetched not very long ago, but with the Trump administration became a very real fear. And obviously that takes you down the road to saying, how could Europe defend itself in the absence of the United States? But I think there's long been uh, a, a slightly less existential, but still highly relevant question as to, you know, what can the European Union do when the United States doesn't want to act or it feels that, that its interests aren't, 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 uh, aren't in, at stake, whereas European ones are. And I, I think that's a riddle that we maybe haven't yet solved. And I think both of these questions, you know, the desire to be more influential over the over the United States via military capabilities and the desire to to have capabilities that one can use in the absence of the United States. They both raise these rather acute collective action problems and, and it's nowhere more acute than actually the deployment of a military force. And, and I think I'd be very interested to hear what Ambassador Vimon thinks, but I think there's maybe been a shift away from conceptualizing CSDP around a, a kind of um, a, a high level 
um, high intensity kind of autonomous uh, European uh, multinational force or, or, or forces towards the CSDP, maybe helping European diplomacy and backing up European diplomacy by rather more behind the scenes, encouraging capability development. So trying to draw on that aggregate power that the EU potentially presents um, through means such as the European Defence Fund, um, which which I believe now um, put ranks the EU as a as a as a, as a spender on 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 technology and defence, maybe like third fourth place amongst EU member states. So it becomes a a power there, uh, and then behind the scenes, maybe a coordinator of bilateral and small group uh, military cooperation through PESCO, through other means. Um, you know. Uh, Cooperative projects like the, the, the Franco Franco British actually um, uh, uh, treaties of Lancaster House, and so we have the EU as as, as not necessarily uh, a front line military force, but as a means for European states to address those challenges of entrapment and abandonment, to to try to aggregate their, their military capabilities more effectively, to make their spending more efficient uh, and effective, and um, I don't want to uh, go on too, too much longer because I've already taken too much time by being out of the room, <laughs> but um, I'd be very interested to hear uh, what, what Ambassador Vimon felt about that, 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 that drift within CSDP, maybe away from operations and more towards being the, the kind of the EU as a role as uh, a coordinator and, and a sister in terms of aggregating um, EU military power. So, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Excellent, Ben. So uh, the, the question is direct to, to Pierre. Are we going to see also a potential paradigm shift uh, in CSDP? Uh, some of the attendees are putting a, a question. Uh, what do the different speakers think of such a, a, a shift? When we read, for instance, the German coalition agreement, and uh, when we read between the line, what may be the expectation of the, the upcoming French presidency? Are we having around the corner a, a substantial change in CSDP concept and progressively this role of um, aggregator? You, you mentioned Dr. Jones falling on the EU external action service. Um, very, very briefly, on, on I, I think um, on, on the point made by uh, Professor Ben Ben Jones, I I entirely agree with him, and and, and I personally think it's already happening under our eyes, um, and I, and I think in foreign policy in, in broad terms, uh, this notion of of a more flexible Europe is is also happening under our eyes. Um, uh, as I was alluding to it earlier, um, this um, way of dealing with the Iranian nuclear program with three member states in the lead, plus the um, uh, EU high representative, is a format that many of our partners uh, enjoy uh, outside of Europe. Uh, Time and again, I've heard my American colleagues telling me, why don't you use that kind of format more? And in my opinion, it could work if for, if with, two, uh, with two caveats. One is that you need to have uh, always representative from the EU institution. And secondly, it shouldn't be always the big states involved. And I'm not saying this because Cornelius is there, but because I, I, I deeply sense that this is important. Uh, and uh, I think um, this is a lesson to be learned in many of the uh, ongoing crises we're facing today. If um, in a, we could try to put together member states that know well about what is going on in, 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 in the Middle East. Um, and certainly Cyprus is, uh, is, is a country that knows well what is going on there, or in Latin America or in Africa. And to have those member states who have a good knowledge and who are ready to step in, um, that could make uh, interesting 
core group of uh, uh, like-minded countries that could move forward with the presence of the institution, the high representative or his uh, representatives. Um, that could be an interesting way of being more agile, more proactive, um, and to move quicker than we're doing it at the moment. The nature of the European Union makes it a somewhat cumbersome organization um, that um, moves slowly. Um, and therefore, to be able to move more quickly is, is an important objective that we have to reach. Now, with regard to security and defense uh, as such, I think this idea of um, maybe not going always for high intensity um, conflicts, um, but looking more in the sort of long term vision about how we can bring military capabilities and support um, to partners uh, in, uh, in uh, outside of the European Union and um, and to do it with the tools we have at the moment. Um, to help um, state uh, building capacities, um, uh, to building state capacities, sorry, um, to, um, uh, uh, to um, uh, look at, 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 at different aspects uh, and different dimensions that are related to the, um, the security and defense sector, intelligence uh, that could be provided by those member states who have them. Uh, so on and so forth. But that could be an, another way of doing things. Um, I still think that at some stage, as it is foreseen in the, in the strategic compass, that maybe um, um, a, uh, uh, I think they call it a first entry force, uh, may be useful uh, for the situation where the United States, as it was uh, uh, stated by, by Ben, are not interested, uh, this could still be useful. Um, we have it already, in fact, with the battle groups, and we haven't used them all that much, which brings me back to my whole idea of a need for change of mindset also, because I think it has a lot to do with this. But I think it seems to me that a more flexible Europe in terms of uh, format, in terms of action, in terms of finding new ways of uh, helping our partners, is the right way to proceed, which at the end comes back to my, what I, was my definition of a new brand of diplomatic action. Um, I think Europe shouldn't try to copy the other ones. It should find its own um, style uh, of diplomatic action. Thank you, uh, Pierre. I, I, I'm sure that maybe Ambassador Cornelius would like to, to comment on the, the benefit of improved CSDP or uh, new new format in the field of security and defense, which may have an interest for EU members that are not NATO member uh, at uh, the, the the stage. How do you view, Ambassador, the potential development in this field, and is there any debate in Cyprus about it? Uh, Definitely, as uh, a small member state with uh, a very big uh, problem on the island, it would be in the interest of Cyprus uh, to go in that direction. And of course, we are very supportive of uh, the ideas uh, of President Macron. Uh, it's high time to have a more assertive uh, European Union that listens uh, to more to the member states, like Pierre said, uh, even tasking member states with a, a number of missions. Cyprus can play a role here in the region. We have established these trilateral forms of cooperation. Of course, the, the level is different. Uh, yesterday, the eighth uh, summit uh, with Israel took place. Uh, uh, so uh, there is a, a lot uh, of room in that, in that area. At the same time, we expect the European Union to stand its, its ground to the spoilers, to uh, global and regional spoilers. This is what uh, our citizens expect from the European Union, from a more assertive European Union. Uh, in order to be able to do that, uh, the European Union should be also open, more open to partnerships with like-minded uh, countries, with like-minded partners. And it, depending on, on the thematic, uh, at the same time, 
uh, it's important to have uh, a European Union which uh, will be autonomous uh, to the extent that it will be able to defend uh, the European citizens. Um, the strategic autonomy um, uh, will provide the European Union with the necessary tools that uh, uh, will make uh, her, uh, will make the European Union uh, more effective uh, uh, in its um, engagement or, or with uh, global issues, uh, be the climate change, uh, terrorism, uh, human rights, and so on. So this is uh, how we view it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, we we start with questions we have received from uh, the attendees. We are still around 100 participants, which is uh, remarkable because usually the attrition rate is uh, worse than that. One question is uh, very precise. It's about sanction. Uh, have we been good enough when the US tended to impose on us sanctioned for not uh, being aligned with policies a few years ago. And are we satisfied with uh, the anti-sanction mechanism that was established as a result, especially because this may be coming back uh, in the perspective of other crises where we may be uh, having a, a different appreciation, I read, than the US. So maybe Pierre and, and the ambassador, and then we can enlarge to other aspects. We discuss uh, in the chat cultural diplomacy, parliamentary diplomacy, so the identity too. So we have 10 minutes to finish. So uh, please be, be quick as we have been uh, already. Anti-sanction mechanism, are we happy or do we need to improve? <laughs> The, the problem with sanctions, in, in my opinion, is that it has become the uh, the only tool um, quite often that uh, not only the EU, but many of the um, uh, diplomatic um, uh, services uh, around the world are using at the moment when they're facing a crisis. Um, they are necessary because um, they give a clear message uh, to, the, uh, to the other side, I would say, uh, but they're not enough. Um, you need to have a second, a second leg, which is one uh, that goes with um, sanctions. Sanctions being um, a posture of firmness, of uh, of a capacity to resist and to stand firm. Uh, but you need to have also the second leg, which is about dialogue, which is about uh, resuming, uh, by a way or another, the discussions with the other side, in order to get out of the kind of um, stalemate where where you are. Um, the risk with sanctions is that they don't deliver a solution uh, in and of themselves. Uh, you need more than that. Uh, with regard to uh, the whole issue of anti-coercion, this is a bit different. It relates to the uh, what we're witnessing more and more around the world was is the way um, some of the um, uh, foreign policy actors are weaponizing um, uh, migration, um, trade, uh, whatever, financial um, instruments in order to make their case, uh, their political case, and to force uh, the other side to follow their political point of view, even if you totally disagree with them. So that's another issue, and this is where I think so far the EU has not been very uh, effective and performing the way it should. Um, um, I think at the end of the day, it's not as much as about, about finding new instruments. It's about having maybe new instruments that deter your your the other side uh, from going ahead with the weaponizing of of trade or 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 finances. It's more about having the right tools to deter and to bring everybody back around the negotiating table. I think this is really the issue. Ambassador Cornelius, any point of view on this one? Yes, very, very briefly. I, I agree with the last point of uh, Pierre. This, is, uh, this, is, this should be the aim uh, of uh, sanctions. 
it's a tool, but it should lead to a policy change. It should not be a, of a punitive nature. And uh, the EU definitely sh should not uh, have uh, double standards when we uh, follow, uh, I mean, this uh, this policy of sanctions. We need to be credible in our approach. Uh, with regards to the United States, we should not forget that the United States uh, has been a very close partner of the European uh, continent of, the Euro of the Europe for the last uh, uh, 60, 70 years. So uh, it's important to uh, have uh, a dialogue, more dialogue uh, also on this issue with the United States. Excellent, sorry to, to be brief now on the delivery of the, the last question. Uh, already uh, the uh, European diplomacy is sui generis and quite a complex one. How can it uh, include better the parliamentary diplomacy uh, as a, an additional tool? Uh, a question uh, from very likely one of our colleagues here working on parliamentary diplomacy. Pierre and also colleagues, I, I know that in uh, our, our work, Katerina uh, has uh, done uh, some element also on parliamentary diplomacy. So the question is for all of us. Uh, I, I think that we're hit, hitting at, um, uh, at another issue um, that we haven't um, discussed very much up to now is, is how do you, uh, how do you reinforce, how do you enhance the, um, the policy making process? Um, uh, I, I, I alluded to that very quickly when, when I was mentioning the European Council uh, guidelines and how do you implement them. But it seems to me more generally, um, with regard to foreign policy, we need to beef up um, the level of preparation of those um, decision um, and to get all the right elements uh, being part of this. And there, of course, it's about how to um, improve the, um, the ability of the advisors around the one, the decision makers, um, the ability to get the right assessment, the right analysis, the right information, um, uh, be it the external action service, the commission um, inside the member states. And I think in, in that field, the European Parliament, um, uh, its delegations that travel around the world, um, uh, their, the information they manage together, uh, the very good questions they may have, which are quite often very relevant, the exchanges that take place between the institutions or the member states and the European Parliament, all this should be brought together um, in order to improve the quality, um, the cohesiveness, the um, uh, the coherence uh, of the uh, of the EU decision making process and the decisions themselves, the nature of the decisions themselves. So this is how I see the European Parliament finding its, its role inside the system. And there surely is room for improvement there uh, uh, because we have already these exchanges, um, these uh, auditions, um, uh, hearings in the, uh, in the European Parliament with officials from the Commission or the External Action Service. I sh think we should go a little bit further. Um, probably um, an improved system of uh, information exchange, first of all. Uh, um, I know there is the whole issue of confidentiality, but I think there are ways to get around that, uh, that problem. Um, and then a, a greater involvement at, at the early stage of the decision-making process. I think we could, we could improve. We have been very cautious up to now, um, I think we could move uh, uh, a little bit more and uh, and be a, a, a more innovative here again, as, as I was saying earlier, more creative there. Excellent. This is coming to, together with uh, a, a question about um, the accountability 
of the high representative vice president vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the, the, the parliament. And the idea is the, the following, if the service is to become more autonomous, more autonomy comes with more responsibility. So what is the kind of democratic accountability we would have for a, a, a service that would have a larger autonomy? But I think you, you gave us already a few elements of uh, answer uh, here. The last question for all panelists uh, that may also be of uh, interest for, from, for many is what has been the impact so far of Brexit on EU public, uh, on EU diplomacy? Is this a non-event? Everything is as before. Is this a, a challenge or um, has there been a, a sign that this is making the life of the EU diplomacy more complex, especially because there could be forum shopping for um, other organizations and that the EU would not be considered as a prime actor to search for? Uh, also, Ambassador Cornelius, I, I think Cyprus is still a member of the Commonwealth, so you're a kind of on the, the on the the two plates here. Uh, what is the impact of Brexit on the potential of EU uh, diplomacy? Well, uh, you mentioned Cyprus, uh, that uh, Cyprus is still a member of uh, the Commonwealth. Uh, this is because of our uh, historic relations with the UK. Uh, at the same time, and I was at that time in, in Brussels, I mean, we did manage uh, to handle the Brexit and uh, the precautions of Brexit because we stayed united. I think this is uh, the only answer also in this regard. If uh, the member states uh, are united in their goals, in their priorities with regards to the foreign policy, then they can uh, also handle uh, the global Britain. Pierre and maybe uh, Dr. Jones. Certainly, I'll be, I'll be quick. Um, I don't think it is a non-event uh, because the simple fact that uh, British diplomats are not anymore in the room where their great expertise and their professionalism is something we're missing. It's, um, it's a lost opportunity for, for the European Union. And I've said it uh, before the Brexit took place, I say it today. Even if we have managed ways to, um, to keep uh, Britain into some of those flexible formats where we had before, they're still part of the EU 5 plus 1 in the Iranian negotiation. Uh, we still have uh, regular meetings with them in, uh, in different formats uh, when we discuss the Middle East, uh, the, um, the whole issue of strategic stability in Europe, whatever. So uh, I think we have tried to find a way through. Uh, but the fact that so far we haven't been able to set up a new a new framework and new processes um, uh, to have uh, some formal discussions between the EU and Britain in the field of foreign policy and security policy is um, is um, is sad, uh, I think, and is a loss for both sides. It's a lose lose situation. Now, of course, the whole point there is how to rebuild trust uh, to get back and, and work for that kind of, of agreement. Uh, because in, in its absence, uh, there is always pending there uh, like a, um, a Democles sword that um, what Britain is thinking about, what Britain may try to do, uh, uh, think about what happened recently um, with the whole issue of the submarine, the Australian submarines and, and France. Um, and uh, one can think about also about the kind of activity we have witnessed in other parts of Europe. There's always this impression at the moment that Britain is working on its own and trying to take some advantage of the current situation. And, and I think this is bad for both sides and that we need to dispel that kind of um, mistrust or distrust, I don't know how to, to name it, 
um, that is standing there as a shadow between us. I unfortunately think it very much depends on the um, domestic politics on both sides, on both sides, I insist on this, and that as long as on one side we want to prove that the other side is wrong and made a wrong decision, um, and that goes for both sides, once again, um, I think to rebuild that uh, trust and that um, climate of confidence uh, between um, the EU and UK will take some time, unfortunately. Uh, um, but that's what diplomats are used to, um, you know, to um, play on time and hope that something will good will come out of it at the end. Professor uh, Dr. Jones, uh, your, your view from the other side? Yes, well, I very much agree with um... Uh, with Ambassador Vimon's la last point there, you know, um, ab about it, ab about there being this kind of um, uh, almost narrative about who was right, you know, and, and in a way that on the technical side, this should not be the most difficult bit of the agreement. In fact, under the May government, I think there was plans to do this because it doesn't involve the single market. It doesn't involve the European Court of Justice. It's, it's a rather intergovernmental branch of EU activity, so it shouldn't be technically difficult to do this. And, and again, as, uh, as Monsieur Vermont says, that, that, that there's a win-win to be had here. And yet what seems to be the problem is a, is a kind of ideological kind of narrative issue about uh, the UK wanting to demonstrate that global Britain is, a, is, a, is, is something that's not the European Union. Um, but again, if you look at, for example, the integrated review that the UK conducted recently, it does make some, you know, modest uh, advances in UK presence in the Indo-Pacific, for example. But it's essentially a, it's a very heavily NATO based European security document. Uh, so uh, this this kind of almost, I don't know, sometimes kind of childish uh, behavior to 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 say well the eu doesn't do any the, the eu isn't a valuable actor in this field i think is is ridiculous we saw some some silly shenanigans over the recognition of the the, the eu's uh, representative in london all those things need to go at so, at some point i think they will go because they're just not sustainable um but uh, again i you know uh, I defer to, to Ambassador Vimon's great, greatest, greater wisdom on these matters of diplomacy. I think he's right. I think it's going to be a, a, a long, well, hopefully not a very long term, but I think a kind of medium term project for diplomacy to, to bring the, to get back to the shared interests that are so obviously there. And, and a very quick point, just to say, I'm very grateful that you've reached out to, to me as a UK academic now. Uh, and I would really, I really think this this needs to continue. That those bits of uh, EU and uh, UK civil society that can keep continuing to talk should very much continue to talk, in my view. Excellent. This is, this could be your mot de la fin, uh, Dr. Jones. Maybe a, a last word from Pierre uh, Vimont and from Ambassador. Cornelius too, before giving them a, a last time the floor and before uh, a final word of conclusion by our director uh, general, just to thank all colleagues involved in preparing uh, this very interesting event, uh, colleagues from all the different services of the EPRS and Cécile uh, Charlier of the innovation uh, team, a uh, colleague of the director B, uh, Isabel Ioannides, our colleague of uh, Directorate, see my directorate, uh, Richard Friedman. Uh, many have been uh, a helpful hand in this uh, operation, and we will try to publish uh, in video and maybe even uh, in written uh, text part of the, the proceeding because it was really worse. In a, a recent visit uh, to uh, Cyprus and Greece, the, the Pope said that politics is the art of the common goods, and there is no more precious common good than peace. And this is in the hands of diplomats. So we're very, very fortunate to have two top diplomats with us uh, 
national and EU diplomat at the, the same time. Final word is for you, Ambassador Cornelius, final word is for you, Pierre, and then maybe Anthony can have a, a conclusion. Ambassador Cornelius. Yes, since you mentioned the Pope, uh, I will start with the Pope. Uh, we are with the faith. Uh, we in Cyprus are still great believers of the EU project. Uh, it has an added value uh, for its member states, for the EU citizens. Uh, and in that regard, uh, the, Europe the EAS, uh, the, uh, the European External Action Service has a special role in forging the different opinions of the 27 member states as a custodian of uh, the European Union's unity. But uh, in, uh, in, 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 they should also, in that regard, uh, take into consideration, into serious consideration, the, mem the, the member states' positions and the sensitivities of all member states. Uh, and as I said before, it's also important, you know, to uh, have uh, selective partnerships with uh, like-minded countries in order to promote uh, solutions uh, uh, in, a challenge, in the challenges that we are facing. Uh, collective solutions, which will make them more effective. And last but not uh, least, we should not forget that the European Union, despite its deficiencies, it is uh, still perceived by the international community as an honest broker. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Frank, I don't have much to add as you have uh, uh, mentioned the Pope. I think uh, after reading the Pope's words, we should all remain silent to some extent. My, my, the only point I would, I would just stress at, at the end of our conversation, and I thank you once again, um, the European Parliament Research Center for having uh, organized this, uh, this conversation, is that I, I think we are on the eve of, uh, of, uh, of major changes as we go ahead, because the times, the times as they stand, are calling the new realities of the global world are calling for that kind of change. Uh, and I think the European Union member states, uh, the EU institutions are more and more aware of this need for change. Um, the ongoing discussion uh, about the strategic compass are a very good illustration of this. They are serious, they are solid, um, even if there are differences between the member states I, I see all of them trying to find uh, solutions to those differences and moving ahead. So in spite of being critical at some point in my intervention about where the European Union stands today in its diplomatic action, I still there is a lot of room for hope. Um, and this would be the positive note on which I would end my intervention. <laughs> Anthony? Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Frank, for moderating the discussion. Thank you very much to Katarina, to Cornelius and to Ben for being such effective discussants and making very interesting, uh, very interesting reflections and remarks about what um, uh, Ambassador Vimor has presented to us. And most especially, of course, thank you so much to Pierre Vimor for um, sharing his wisdom and his insights after a very long and distinguished career as um, a, a, a not only a diplomat, but clearly a very deep thinker about the lessons and the practice of diplomacy. And it's been a great privilege for you, for us really, for, the, for you to express those um, thoughts um, in such a, a wise and considered way. And we really do appreciate it. So thank you so much for delivering the 2021 EPRS annual lecture. Um, next year's lecture, I can't give you a date, but I can say that it will be given by um, uh, Bridget Laffin, who recently retired uh, from the European University Institute, where she was the director for many years of the Robert uh, Schumann Centre, and we look forward to that very much. And our final EPRS uh, event of the year will be uh, next Tuesday uh, at 4.30 in the afternoon. Um, and it will be, again, actually something which we do once a year, which is where we invite in uh, half a dozen or so uh, think tankers to talk about the significance of the year that we've just lived through. Another year of living dangerously, the one on 
2020 was, uh, of course, fascinating because we saw, a, in effect, a paradigm shift globally in terms of our culture, society, working methods and way of life. And people will be taking stock as to how far uh, those changes that we identified last year have been carried through or themselves have shifted in various ways. So uh, what we call think tank takeaways from 2021 will be the subject of our last EPRS roundtable next Tuesday afternoon. And we look forward to as many of you as possible joining us on that occasion. And then very finally, once again, thank you to, to Pierre and to those others who've joined us, not in his discussants, but indeed as participants, over 100 people online for taking part in this year's EPRS annual lecture. Thank you very much and have a very nice afternoon. Goodbye.